Thanks everyone for joining. We'll get started in just a few minutes. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome to the 2022 Better Buildings Summer Webinar Series, dedicated to bringing you the latest actionable insights from leading industry experts. This annual series is a chance to explore the topics, technologies, and trends that affect your organization, as well as efforts to accelerate energy efficiency adoption. Before we dive in, there are a few housekeeping points I'd like to cover. Please note that today's webinar will be recorded and archived on the Better Building Solution Center and we'll follow up when today's recording and slides are available. Next, attendees are all in listen only mode, meaning your microphones are muted. If you experience any audio or visual issues throughout the webinar, please send a message in the Q&A box located on the bottom of your Zoom panel. Next slide. So my name is Brooke and I'm your moderator for today's session, which is focused on community resilience. I'd like to get us oriented today around the topic of community resilience. And I wanted to share a map many of you are familiar with, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's annually published map of billion dollar disasters. This will show 2021 in which 20 separate weather events recorded nationwide cost over 1 billion in damages each, which made 2021 the third highest year on record for the number of events. So as we're all experiencing, national, natural disasters are becoming more frequent and severe and straining our electric grid. Just the year before, in 2020, the, the Energy Information Administration reported that U.S. electricity customers experienced power outages lasting an average of eight hours, which is the longest average outage duration per customer since the EIA began tracking in 2013. So to mitigate against the impact of severe disruption in power and to ensure food, water, shelter, healthcare, and other necessities are there when they're needed most, Communities across the country are pursuing investments in energy efficiency and on-site generation and storage to keep the lights on. Next slide. So what are critical facilities? So at DOE, we often use this term to describe the building or infrastructure that provides essential public services that are needed to keep operational during an emergency event. Typical examples may include emergency shelters, healthcare facilities, food preparation or water treatment plants, and importantly, community residents often have a strong say in what places are critical to them to have operating during an emergency event. And they need to plan accordingly to make sure that these community resilience hubs are equipped to stay online during a major outage. And two of our panelists today uh, will share their approaches to community resilience. Next slide. So when considering backup power needs, whether by an existing diesel generator or even going further to add on-site generation battery storage, Making sure your building is as energy efficient as possible is a really critical first step. From lowering the cost of a new backup power system or improved performance of an existing system, energy efficiency provides a number of benefits for resilience. It can help ensure that energy used is reserved for critical functions such as lighting or heating and cooling. It can put less of a strain on the grid during an emergency event. It also increases passive survivability the ability to maintain indoor air temperatures to a comfortable degree when an outage does occur. And you'll see a short non-comprehensive list of common high impact energy efficiency projects that building owners might consider here. And you'll also hear from one of our panelists about a powerful freely available online tool that you can use to con conduct site specific analyses to determine the most cost effective backup power system to meet your re unique resilience needs. Next slide. 
So for more public sector specific information, resources, and toolkits on energy efficiency and renewable energy investments, I encourage you to visit the State and Local Solutions Center website. These resources also include our annual guide, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Resources for State and Local Leaders, in addition to a link to our energy resilience in the public sector webpage. We also hope you'll subscribe to our State and Local, local Spotlight newsletter, our monthly newsletter with over 33,000 subscribers, and you can also stay in touch with us um, at state and local at ee.dewey.gov. And I'd also like to note that these links and resources mentioned here and by our panelists will be available to attendees following the presentation. So with that, we can go to the next slide and I'll tell you about the interactive platform we'll be using for Q&A, polling and feedback. Please go to www.slido.com on your mobile device or by opening a new window in your internet browser. Today's event code is hashtag DOE. If you would like our panelists, if you would like to ask our panelists questions, please submit them anytime throughout the presentation. We will be answering your questions near the end of the session. And you can select the thumbs up icon for questions that you like, which will result in the most popular questions moving to the top of the screen. So we want to learn more about who is joining us today. So let's start off with a few polls. So what sector best describes your organization? We have a lot of options here. Obviously, our, a lot of our content is focused on our public sector folks. But as we know, these issues impact all of us. I see a lot of contractors, state government, local government, and nonprofits. That's awesome. OK. Pretty good mix. Excellent. Looking like we'll, we're leveling out here. So with that, we can go to our next poll, which is a fun word cloud. This is your opportunity to write in your answers to this question. They'll appear on the screen. What are your biggest challenges to making resilience investments? As expected, funding, top of the list. I'm also seeing capacity, legal authority, community support, old buildings. This is a really thorough list. I'm excited we'll get to get into each of these a little bit in more depth today. Outstanding. Okay, well, thank you all for participating in our polls. I'm glad you know now how to use Slido. I wanna shift now to introducing our great lineup of speakers. So today's presenters, we have Ian Lahiff, who currently helms the energy performance of the city of Orlando's building portfolio, made up of over 7 million square feet, continuously driving toward Mayor Dyer's goal of 100% renewable energy for all city facilities by 2030. Next, we have Tony Sparks, who works for the Facilities Design and Construction Department of Albuquerque Public Schools, where he is staff project manager for HVAC systems, energy efficiency, and sustainability. He is also coordinator of the APS Water and Energy Conservation Committee and the APS Energy Team. Finally, we have Indu Manogaran, who is a research engineer at National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Her focus is performing techno-economic analysis using NREL's REOPT tool to inform on-site distributed energy strategies and decisions. Thanks to all of you for being with us today. Uh, and with that, um, I'd love to hand it off to Ian to kick us off. Great. Thank you so much for having me today. This is a uh such a pleasure to speak with everybody. And I, I love seeing all those different word cloud responses on that screen. A lot of different variety and, and great background there. Um, slide, please. So today I'm gonna to be telling you a little bit about the Resilience Hub project that we're working on here in the city of Orlando. Slide. 
Uh, here at the city of Orlando, we're really focused on creating equitable resilience. And we believe this Resiliency Hub project will help us accelerate us towards that goal. We also have a suite of other sustainability goals that I wanna share with you. Slide. Back in 2007, the city of Orlando, under the leadership of Mayor Buddy Dyer, convened a diverse stakeholder group of community members, industry partners, and other folks across our city to come up with a holistic set of goals that's really focused on seven different key areas of sustainability. We're focused on clean energy, green buildings, local food systems, zero waste, livability, clean water, and electric and alternative transportation. And it's not just a set of goals and, and things that we're shooting for, but actually KPIs and metrics that we're tracking. And we've been doing this since 2007. Slide. <clears throat> this Greenworks initiative has actually morphed and evolved into other more discrete focus areas over the past couple of years. And I'm telling you this because this is really driving towards all of our different department's participation, and we're forcing ourselves to align with these different uh, community action plans as we move forward. Uh, namely, some of the important ones are Municipal Operations Sustainability Plan, our Climate Vulnerability Assessment, a Greenhouse Gas Inventory, a Community Sustainability Action Plan, our Vision Zero Plan, which is really focused on eliminating pedestrian fatalities, and then our Future Ready Master Plan. So as we touch on resilience investments across our city, we wanna make sure that we're aligning with all of these other action plans that we've received community engagement and involvement in uh, to make sure that this is what the, the community wants moving forward. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, one of the main ones that we've looked at as we uh, identify our focused areas of investment is our community vulnerability assessment. Uh, and this action plan was aligned with the covenant of mayors and looked at the probability, the impact, uh, the different intensity and increasing frequency of these climate hazards that we're, that we're facing almost uh, all the time here, especially in the summer months here in Florida. Next slide. <clears throat> As you can imagine, especially for any of the folks in the audience from the Southeast, uh, our biggest hazard is the tropical storm season, uh, which runs from about April to seems like November these days. Uh, here in Orlando, we're not as vulnerable to say a storm surge or, or that tidal influx like our friends on the coast, but we do see a lot of sea uh, rising water through our different bodies of water and lakes. And we're hit with a lot of the uh, out, outer bands of rain from either an East Coast or a West Coast storm. It seems like every year Orlando's in that cone of uncertainty, if you will, no matter which way the storm is coming. Next slide. Uh, this is just kind of an interesting graphic that shows since 1950, all of the different, uh, what we call spaghetti models coming at us and Orlando's right there smack in the middle. So, so we're, we're really uh, experienced with this. Uh, and we know that with these storms comes power outages and food shortages, lack of internet access, which really disconnects our community, uh, ice and access to clean water. And um, we wanna get ahead of a lot of these uh, issues and hazards as opposed to just being reactive. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, we're also aware that every state uh, except Florida about a year and a half ago battled freezing temperatures over the winter and, in, and especially in Texas we saw how unprepared the state was for uh, these different unexpected freezes and we're actually seeing that the opposite this summer with a lot of folks out there that are served by ERCOT, the, the Texas grid, as well as our friends across the pond in Great Britain are seeing unprecedented heat waves. So. Uh, you know, as these things happen and people throw into a crisis, the electrical grid is unable to handle the demand, people lose power, and unfortunately, some people uh, pass away due to these hazards as well. Uh, I know at, at least 30 people died during that the Texas uh, issue, as well as uh, the exacerbating circumstances from hypothermia, carbon monoxide poisoning, house fires, and other things that happen due to grid failures and the lack of resiliency. Here in Florida, we saw that nursing homes also su suffered devastating preventable deaths due to power insecurities. And this actually prompted legislative changes that now require backup generators for these facilities. It's an example of a building that was not previously considered a cri mission critical facility, like say a hospital, uh, but now because of its impact to the community, we have to make these smart investments to be able to prevent uh, and get ahead of these issues moving forward. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, 
So the city of Orlando is really focused on equitable resilience, and we feel that this Resiliency Hub project will help us accelerate towards a lot of those goals outlined in those community action plans and hit on the climate vulnerability assessment factors that we identified. Moving forward, next slide. So to proactively address these risks and vulnerabilities, we're making these strategic investments in these community facilities. Now these are existing city facilities that we're targeting. Uh, these buildings already provide a lot of uh, established, trusted, uh, community managed resources to, to the different neighborhoods. They're used year round for before and after school care, basketball tournaments, t-ball games, aquatics, swim lessons, meals on wheels. They do a lot of different um, amenities for these these neighborhoods. And we realized that by leveraging these existing buildings and making smart investments, they'll be able to serve these community members uh, uh, more beneficially. <clears throat> We're also leveraging the US Sustainability Directors Network, and they have some great resiliency hub uh, guidance documents to assist local governments and other community-based organizations to make these decisions and provide that community engagement uh, to be able to take action with these facilities. Next slide. As we identify these buildings and we identify the different factors that we're going to upgrade and enhance, we want to make sure that we're striving to re restore what FEMA calls its five lifelines. So the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency has different focus areas that we want to make sure that we're touching on with these buildings as well. Uh, energy, food, water, and shelter, health and medical aid, safety and security, and communications. And a lot of these touch points are already felt uh, during normal operations. Uh, the health and medical, for instance, our city facilities were used as COVID testing centers and vaccine distribution sites. Uh, they're also used for sandbag distribution uh, leading up to a storm. They provide food service uh, before and after school care and, and meals for for students in our community. And we're already hitting a lot of these different uh, areas, but if we're not able to work when the power is out, we basically have a stranded asset in the building that's not able to provide these services. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we realized that these, this term resilience hub is gaining traction. It's an equity-based strategy for disaster preparedness, but it's an overarching term. A resilience hub can mean a lot of different things depending on your different area of the country and, and what climate risks and hazards you're trying to mitigate. Here in Orlando, we're touching on a few different areas, and this may look different uh, in, in your neighborhood, but uh, renewable on-site power generation is one of the things that we're shooting for, but we're not uh, ruling out conventional power generation as well. Communication and bridging that digital divide is utmost importance to us. Uh, it, it's really a, a utility at this point, uh, as, and I know the FCC is uh, adopting that phrasing as well. But it's a single point of access. People can get online, they can sign up for social services, they can connect with others and loved ones and let them know that they're okay after a storm. We also have a broad community uh, farm system that's set up around our different community centers, uh, but we'll also be able to provide food pantry amenities and a place to be able to get people back on their feet quicker. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So in, in order to do this, we've sought roughly $3 million, $2.85 million through a HUD grant last year. And we're excited to share that we actually landed that grant. Uh, we're making smart investments in six resilience hubs, six existing facilities that are gonna be able to provide community lifelines in the recovery phase and leading up to a disaster. We're gonna do that by focusing on a couple of different areas, improving electrical infrastructure and improving the HVAC, uh, as well as the ability to uh, accept uh, auxiliary power generation. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. These buildings have a tremendous value, like I said, to these communities, uh, but we also know that by using a familiar site, a familiar building, people will be able to shelter at home, even if they don't have power at home, but they'll be able to go to their neighborhood community center and get what they need and get back up on their feet. It's safer in the long run than going to an emergency shelter where people are packed in. There can be some other cause of, uh, issues and friction associated with that. Uh, this totally reduces the stay of the need for emergency shelters, and it allows residents to spend the recovery phase of disasters in their familiar neighborhoods where they're more likely to have social supports. Next slide, please. <laughs> in targeting these different areas, our team identified six neighborhoods across the city as ideal places to establish resilience hubs. We use mapping software and application stuff on the HUD website and align these facilities with distinct low to moderate income LMI communities. 
We also selected larger neighborhood centers, uh, larger square foot facilities, so they have more amenities and they can accommodate more people safely. And one thing I should mention is these are not emergency shelters. These are not buildings that people are gonna ride out the storm, but folks that can uh, utilize leading up to and directly after the storm. A different government ag agency, the county, focuses on the actual emergency shelters. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So these six neighborhood shelters were selected for their geographic spread. Uh, we're trying to have a diversity of electrical infrastructure. The transmission lines and substations are serving different community centers across the building, uh, across the city. So that way, if we have a substation goes, goes down, that serves uh, a series of government buildings. They're not all going to go down because we're selecting different facilities across the city. <clears throat> This map shows the medium household income with the dark rust color representing the lowest income households and the dark blue color representing the highest income households. So all of our city selected facilities with the yellow flags are representing the lowest income households or the folks that are going to be most burdened by uh, ongoing energy or uh, the ability to prepare for a storm. storm. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We also mapped racial characteristics. Uh, the following map shows the racial, and then the next map shows ethnic makeup of the neighborhoods served by the community centers. Four of these centers are predominantly African-American neighborhoods. Uh, and one was actually the very first school for African-American children in Orlando built in the 1920s. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the other two centers, Inglewood and Dover Shores are located in areas of high percentage of Hispanic population on the east side of town and that dark purple. <clears throat> next slide, please. Uh, so we're utilizing the U.S. Sustainability Directors Network Guide as a model. We've gone through, we've identified our different facilities, we've secured funding, and now we're distilling our effort and investment into three distinct areas while still trying to incorporate these future-ready features and the different community action plan metrics that I described earlier. Uh, we're trying to focus on improving the electrical infrastructure, improving the indoor air quality, and hopefully purchasing generators to be able to land at at least two of the facilities. <clears throat> We'll be using the latest in ASHRAE and CDC guidance on the HVAC systems and upgrading the filtration and the uh, mitigation of indoor air borne contaminants so that as we're inviting people into these buildings leading up to or following a storm, we're not doing it in a way that's going to enhance transmission or be a vector for more airborne diseases. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, we also realize that this is a long-term project. We're utilizing federal funding and there's a, a, a lot that goes into being able to utilize that. Uh, we're trying to get points on the board in the short term. And one of the things that we're happy to share is our small tables of connection or smaller resilience hubs. One of the things that we did is, next slide please, touched on one of the FEMA lifelines and just focused in on that, uh, the digital divide or the ability to have that communication. We worked with the University of Central Florida and we actually mapped internet access and speed across our different zip codes in the city of Orlando and then overlaid that with US census tract data and income levels. We were able to identify distinct neighborhoods that didn't have access to this broadband internet and they also may not be served by one of these larger resilience hubs in the near future as we move forward with that project. So next slide, please. Uh, we actually worked with the AARP and we secured a grant for these really cool, what we're calling tables of connection. They're tables, they're ADA accessible. They actually are hurricane uh, wind rated as well. They provide charging, off-grid wireless and uh, 4G and 5G hotspots along with LED lighting. Next slide, please. So these are some of our tables of connection. Uh, we worked with local artists to really paint some art on these areas that reflect the community that they're serving. Uh, we've seen a lot of use at these facilities uh, and we're happy to use this as a, uh, a first way to engage these communities as we work on longer term projects to improve the re equitable resilience of these uh, communities and facilities across the city of Orlando. Next slide. <clears throat> so you can just click through these next few slides. These are just pictures of some of our tables of connection as we've installed across the city. Um, I also wanna add for the folks that are on the call, especially some of our contractors and service providers, we'll be pushing out the solicitation for the architectural and engineering design requirements for these six uh, resiliency hub projects, uh, hopefully by the end of the summer. So keep an eye out for that. Sign up for vendor link at the city of Orlando website and thank you for having me today. Outstanding, Ian. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and with that, we will transition over to Tony Sparks.
from Albuquerque Public Schools. Tony? Good morning. Thank you. And I'm going to tell a story from the perspective of the public school sector. And that's going to be a little different. Next slide, please. So we are one of the largest school districts in, in the country, certainly the largest in New Mexico. And we have a culture of sustainability that's built in. We work hard at it. But we also have to work hard at it because it's not always that easy to do in this kind of environment. So I'm going to tell the story of how we tripped on resiliency through necessity or practicality. Next slide, please. Just looking at our largest school in the district, it's a Trisco Heritage Academy High School. Um, largest footprint is kind of like a small city. <laughs> and the largest utility bills, we were having issues with how much money we spent on electricity there. The summertime electricity bills are, are over $50,000, and more than half of that is demand charges for how much energy is used at any one time. So that was a focus point for us, and we decided we would do a battery storage project to uh, shave peak in the summertime, or throughout the year, but especially in the summertime. Next slide, please. So we looked at a few different sites, but Trisco Heritage was the obvious one because of, of its size and uh, utility footprint. But there's some other things about it that made it very attractive to try and do a, a battery storage type project. It's the center of the community there, has a large disadvantaged population. It's kind of out on the edge of town. Next slide, please. And the demographics show that 14% uh, are from disadvantaged households. Almost all of them uh, are eligible for federal free or reduced lunch by federal programs. Um, 20% are have English as a second language. They're not even English speakers. 2,200 students is how large that school is. It also happens to have an on-site community health clinic. So the demographics of that made it a, an ideal location to do something progressive. Next slide, please. It's also pretty cool because this was the site that was chosen for the opening scene of an Avengers movie in 2012. That's uh, Nick Fury's helicopter flying into headquarters, Avengers headquarters um, at a Trisco Heritage Academy campus. If you get a chance to watch the movie, look for that. Next slide. So here was the concept. We would choose a battery and put it on the grid and charge it at night when, when electricity was inexpensive and discharge it during the day. The goal was to reduce the peak demand below 500 kilowatts, and the demand that we experience at that school is as much as a megawatt at any given time. So um, we're trying to cut it in half, and the 500 kilowatts is, is already included in our base uh, utility bill, so it would save potentially all of our uh, demand charges if we could reduce it that much. It was also um, the first time we've done it, first time any school district around has done something like this. So it was a test case for the district and a way for us to consider what, um, what we could do throughout the district to save money. But it also gave us a thought that this is a potential now for, for resiliency during a power emergency. We have a large um, battery there and we could use that to offset costs. But is it cost effective? Next slide. So we went out to bid with it and, and the costs were a little whew, uh, overwhelming, you might say. It's, it costs a lot of money to, to put a big battery of the size we are looking at. It's actually a, a, a 2,884 2, kilowatt hour battery, um, and it costs a lot of money. But that's what we needed to offset uh, what we expected to experience um, if, with degradation of the battery over a 15 year period. So. The contractors that bid it also gave us an option for a solar panel adder. And by looking at that, we could reduce the payback time of this strategy significantly. Without PV, it was about a 17 year payback to just pay back the battery by reducing demand charges. Uh, with PV, it took it to a, a little under 13 years. However, this was entirely dependent on the utility rate structure in the first case without PV, um, if the utility happened to change their rate policy, which they tend to do regularly, it could turn our financial model on its head. So we chose to add the solar to the battery and make it um, a, a package deal. So this doubled the project cost, but it, uh, projects an overall net savings of three and a half million over the life of the battery, the 15 years. Next slide, please. 
So what kind of battery did we choose? Well, nothing but the finest. The Tesla Mega Pack 2 was the battery was chosen for a number of reasons, but it, it's uh, quick and easy to install. It has some integral uh, safety features built in, including a cooling system and firewall protection between cells. Uh, it's a package that you can pull off of a truck and mount on the ground. So I just wanna give you an idea of the perspective of this school size-wise. If you look in the lower picture there, you can see off to the lower right, that's a parking lot and those little dots are cars. So um, on the far left of that picture is where two roads intersect and that's where our utility service entrance occurs. So the plan was to put this battery um, between the building and the service entrance and intercept a high voltage loop that goes around the campus that serves our electrical powers. Uh, there is the size again of 721 kilowatts. That's uh, the battery power at any one time and 2884 kilowatt hours. So basically four hours worth of discharge at the highest level gets you to that amount. Next slide, please. So this is kind of the layout of what it would look like. And I'm happy to report as of um, a week ago tomorrow. So last Wednesday, our Tesla battery was actually delivered after a number of delays and installed on a pad in that location where you see the large blue bar. Uh, right around the traffic turnaround, we had a crane set up there, a bunch of cameras and stuff and watched it be put in. It'll be enclosed in a structure uh, with cinder walls around it. Um, but there will also be an on-site learning lab out there, access to uh, view the battery and a solar panel uh, mock-up put on the ground there. So students from the school can come and explore what it means to have um, battery and solar on the school. Now I wanna show you how much solar we put on to offset um, the power that we would need. Next slide shows that four of these major roofs are covered wall to wall with panels. And here's an interesting thing. The, the count of the panels came out to about 2,200. And if you recall, there are 2,200 students at the school. So a great metric for you if you're planning on this type of a project is one panel per student. There was a lot of available roof space here. However, it also means if we're covering these roofs, we have to look at their condition and the maintenance of them um, going forward. And we uncovered significant roof repairs needed um, and made some decisions about what we would do with, with the PV system to deal with the roof issues. But that was one of the things we hadn't anticipated and we weren't necessarily going forward at the beginning with PV anyway. So that, that was uh, one of the lessons learned as we came up to it. So next slide, please. So here's the crux of it for this presentation. By adding solar to the battery, we suddenly now had the opportunity to really consider resilience. You have a, a way to disconnect from the grid where you have a power generation source and a storage source that allows you to deploy it when you need it. So this is called islanding, where you separate from the grid. Um, so then we added to our scope of work a feasibility study to identify what would need to be done in order to disconnect from the grid. Um, Ian talked about critical buildings. We talked about critical loads within the campus. And we saw all those different buildings where we identified one building, the gymnasium and cafeteria and library building that has the most resources to act as a resilience uh, area. Um, and it, we couldn't do the entire campus because there's not enough, even with all that PV and that size of battery, there's not enough power to power the whole school um, for a period of time disconnected from the grid. So the first thing to do is uh, conduct that study. And now we're in the process of cre creating an implementation plan and a design for exactly what would be required for a future project to actually pull the trigger on making this uh, an islandable and resilient hub. The next step after you know, paying for the project that's underway is pursuing funding for the implementation project. So next slide, I just wanna share kind of the challenges from a public school perspective. Obsolescence, well, that seems like a weird one, but it's really not because it, uh, the gears move very slowly in a, a public uh, institution like ours. And we've already experienced that some of the older PV systems we put in eight, nine years ago are kind of on the, their last legs and they're at the low end of the technology scale. Um, so the battery world is evolving very quickly um, and PV is trailing right along with it. So technology can go, go obsolete, but also importantly, I wanna mention here, and it's not on the list, but it's a super important factor is, it's new to our utility also. 
we're having uh, lots of struggles with our local utility uh, understanding how to allow interconnection to their grid with a large PV system and a large battery that could also potentially come offline and then come back online. So they're concerned about that, don't know how to deal with it. And for over a year, we've been in discussions with our local utility trying to figure out our uh, interconnection agreement. We think we're right close to the end of it. And it's a good thing because the PVs installed and their battery was installed last week, should be up and running in about a month. We hope we can actually turn it on when that occurs. Um, the second challenge, of course, is cost. Uh, from a public utility perspective, um, how do you afford to do this? How do you justify doing something like this when you have needs all the time anyway? So APS is, tends to be an early adopter of, of sustainability strategies. We have a very robust and committed team. Um, in this case, we are able to partner with, with federal and state resources to make it happen uh, and probably couldn't have done it without that. But even then, it's a very expensive uh, early adopter project. Equity is very big for a school district. If you create a resiliency hub only one place and it takes you years to do it and you can't get to another one for several more years, does that placement at one site exclude others? Is there an equity uh, perception because we're not accommodating the whole district equally. Granted, you have to start somewhere, um, but that's a consideration and a challenge in looking at it. And lastly, is if any of you are involved with a public in entity, leadership is a big deal. You need a champion who's going to take this project from beginning to end. And in our case, you need buy-in from the district leadership. They have to allow us to do it, um, dedicate funds to it, allow us to interact with federal money and state money, so I would just leave you with a couple of questions to ask. We ask ourselves, can we lead the way? And we are leading the way by doing this. Um, how much can we do with the resources and restrictions that we have? And for you, will you lead the way? Now, I just wanna close by showing you the partners that we dealt with, next slide, please, that made this project possible. They brought all sort of expertise um, and resources, a lot of eyes and viewpoints, and certainly shared in the cost of it. But we worked with the US Department of Energy, the San Diego National Laboratories, Clean Energy States Alliance, the State Energy Department, which is uh, Energy Minerals and Natural Resources Department, the school district and the school itself, and on our contracting partner who's been really critical in making all this happen, putting the puzzle pieces together, uh, Osceola Energy. You put all those people together and work toward it and you can have a project that is a success. Thank you. Outstanding, thank you so much, Tony. Um, I'd like to give everyone a quick reminder. I know many of you already have, but please send in questions you have to slido.com with the event code hashtag DOE. Um, I know we're all anxious to get to questions uh, at the end of the session. And so now we will switch it up and hear from Indu um, about a really exciting tool at NREL. Indu, go ahead. Thank you, Brooke. Good morning, everyone. My name is Indu. I'm a researcher at the National Renewable Energy Lab. Next slide, please. So I'll be presenting on NREL's uh, energy planning tool, REOPT, and how it can be used to provide resilient solutions for buildings. Next slide, please. We will discuss what REOPT is and how it works, and also take a look at REOPT web tool, where users can readily access it online to make energy decisions. We'll also take a brief look at a case study from Manatee County, Florida, where we leverage energy efficiency and distributed resources to provide resilient solutions for buildings. Next slide, please. Slide after that. Thank you. REOPT was developed in response to the increasing number of technology options available to be deployed within a site. With these, with these number of technology options, we need a mathematical tool to perform complex analysis and provide an optimal mix of technologies that can be viable economically viable for a given site. That's where REOPT comes in. Next slide, please. REOPT optimizes technology sizes and costs for a specific site. It performs complex decisions and analysis, but also provides actionable results uh, that can be used by a diverse set of stakeholders, including building owners, utilities, developers, etc. It can also help guide investment decisions into these technologies. What is REOPT and how it can be used will be discussed in the next slide. REOPT is a optimization platform that takes in site-specific inputs such as electric loads from the building, 
the resources that the user can select, generally it's solar PV, battery storage, conventional generators like diesel and natural gas, and the economic inputs for these technologies and electric loads. And that includes technology costs, any incentives for these technologies, the utility tariff from the utility provider. And also since REOP performs a long-term analysis over 20 to 25 years, we also need a financial, we also need financial parameters such as escalation rates and uh, discount rates to perform the analysis. With these site-specific inputs, REOP performs the optimization to provide us with a very detailed set of results. Uh, and that includes the technology sizes for the resources that we selected in the inputs, the optimal dispatch, which is how these technologies interact with the grid, how would these technologies interact with the electric load. This is the hourly dispatch information for the given year. We also get project economics. Since this, since REOP conducts a 20 to 25 year analysis, we can get short-term economic results and also long-term economic results. And that includes upfront costs for, the, for deploying these technologies, operating costs for technologies, the lifetime costs, 20, 25 year life cycle costs for this new system compared to baseline, and then at present value, how much totally it would cost to deploy these technologies. Next slide, please. There are several factors that go into understanding if DERs have a potential for your site. That starts with, this, those, do those resources, uh, are those resources technically viable for your site? What those technology costs and incentives are? What the site goals are, analysis goals. We can, are we performing an analysis to get the least cost solution? Or are we adding resilience goals, renewable energy goals to the analysis? The utility cost and consumption also drives the solution. And the financial parameters, like we discussed, this is a long-term analysis, so we do need cost escalators to, to obtain a cumulative economic result. All these put together provides us with the optimal technology mix for, for our site. Next slide, please. REOPT also provides answers to a variety of questions. For example, what is the optimal PV and storage size for my building? How much would it cost to deploy PV and storage for my building? What is the system that I need for my building to sustain a three day outage, a nine day outage, et cetera? Next slide, please. Here we see a sample of how REOPT works in arriving at an optimal result, technology sizes. For the sample site, the be before deploying PV and storage, the load is provided for from electricity from the grid. That is the gray area there. And after deploying PV and storage, we see that PV decreases the reliance on grid. And that decreases in turn the electricity or the utility bill from the electric demand. The storage also decreases or shaves off the peak from 25, 27 megawatts to 22 megawatts. So PV and storage combined decreases the energy costs and the demand costs. And that's how REOPT, Reopt optimizes technologies here. We see a counterbalance in economics. The baseline, which is electricity from the grid, incurs energy and demand charges but adding PV and storage incurs upfront costs, but also saves costs from decreasing the reliance on grid. And that's, that's the balance that REOP strikes to provide us with the optimal results. Next slide, please. When we add a resilience goal to the analysis within REOP, we also see additional set of results that we can get information from. And that is in the form of probability survival curve, which we see here. It provides us with an understanding of what is the probability of surviving a duration of an outage. For example, in this sample graph here, we see that with the generator only system, the system can sustain a five day outage at a 95% probability. So the system can sustain 95% of any five day outage in a given year, but that system cannot sustain any nine day outages. In turn, when we add solar and storage, we see that 
it can sustain a 90 outage at a 90%. So that's where we see the resilience benefit of solar and storage compared to just the generator. Next slide, please. We have as a platform as a multitude of um, multitude of, of ways that we can use the platform, including the API where we can customize the model to, to meet a specific analysis goal, but also the web tool, which users can readily access online. It is a user interface, and we will discuss the web tool um, in the next slide. Next slide, please. When we go to the web tool online, the first page that we see here is on the right side. And it has all the elements that we discussed before. We first have to choose the energy goals. Are we looking for a least cost option? Are we looking for a resilience goal? Are we looking for a clean energy goal? And once we select that, we have to select our technology options, PV, battery, wind, and thermal technologies. Then we have to enter site-specific inputs, including site location, electricity rates, load profiles, PV and battery technology inputs. And also once we select resilience goal, we have an added technology pop-up, which is the generator. So we have all these inputs. And once we enter all these inputs, we can select get results and we are take, taken to the results page of Riot, which is in the next slide. A general results page would look like this. And here we see there the optimal technology size, a four megawatt PV, 300 kilowatt, two hour battery. And in the black bar there, we also see the net present value for the system. Here we see a $2 million in savings over the 20 year analysis period compared to not having PV and battery. We also see the dispatch curve where the PV generator generates energy and how much excess energy is produced, et cetera. And also detailed financial outputs, year one outputs over 20 year outputs, upfront costs, et cetera. Next slide, please. Once we add in the resilience goals, there are additional outputs available to us through the, through the web tool. We see the generator size there. We also see a $2 million in net costs over 25 years that is usually dubbed as the cost of resilience, cost to provide resilience for the site. And we are also provided with the probability survival curve, how much, what is the, prob what is the probability of surviving a three-day outage? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is a um, case study from Manatee County where we an analyze resilience options for two buildings, Public Safety Complex and Nolan Middle School. Um, the goal for the, for the buildings are to sustain a three-day outage. And for the public safety, and the technologies that we use are energy efficiency, diesel generator, solar PV, and battery storage. Next slide, please. For the Public Safety Complex, the question was, it already has a two megawatt diesel generator. Generator, Can energy efficiency, battery, and PV improve the system resilience and also provide economic benefits? And the answer is yes, as we see here. Uh, on the resilience benefit front, we see on the graph on the bottom there that with only a generator, the existing generator, the system can sus only sustain 70% 70 70 of any three-day outage. But once we add PV and storage, we see that that number jumps from 70% to 90%. And once we add a additional 10% EE, that jumps to 100%. So this system with PV storage and 10% EE can sustain any three-day outage compared to not having these systems, which can only sustain 70% of any three-day outages. There's also economic benefits. So a 10% adoption of EE can save $700,000 uh, in life cycle costs. And that is usually resulting from the reduction in utility costs. Next slide, please. For Nolan Middle School, we, um, the, it is an emergency, emergency shelter and it does not have any backup generator. So the task was to design an optimal system which includes on-site generator, energy efficiency, and battery storage. 
um, for to provide resilience for the building. Again, we see economic benefits at 10% uh, in life cycle savings for each 10% adoption of EE. And this graphic showcases a very good understanding of how energy efficiency, battery and storage can be leveraged to provide um, resilience and economic benefits. Using only a generator can cost the system $400,000 while using this diverse set of resources can save the system a million dollars over the lifetime. And that's how we can leverage energy efficiency and BERs to provide resilience for buildings. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. You can access the REOP tool in the website provided. Thank you again for the particip participation. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Indu, and to all of our panelists. Um, we'll now transition to our Q&A. If you haven't already, please go ahead and join us at slido.com with the event code hashtag DOE to submit and upvote your questions. Okay, and I can invite all of our panelists if they wanna come back on screen. I wanna make sure each of you gets a chance uh, to answer. Um, so our most our highly rated question, are there case studies of adapting libraries into resilience hubs? And Tony, if possible, I wanna Hand this over to you. I know you mentioned this in in your discussion. So that the building, um, the building here. we chose was uh, a gymnasium, library, and cafeteria building, so that made sense. But I think Ian might have more perspective from a community library standpoint. Absolutely. Sure. So we actually don't have libraries that we're targeting for this. Uh, we have more of our multifaceted community centers that have gymnasiums and aquatics facilities and, and kitchens and. Uh, and a lot of different amenities that you might not see in a traditional library, although libraries do seem to be in all these different neighborhoods as well. So uh, one of the things that we're working on with our new RFP for new facilities is encompassing some of those other attributes for a library to have meeting space and to have other community features that more traditional floor plan might not have. Got it, thank you. Um, Tony, we can go back to you real quick for yes. a great question. Did APS look at energy efficiency solutions prior to considering adding batteries? Uh, and as a partner in the Better Buildings Challenge, I'm sure you yeah. can speak to that. I'm happy to answer this one. As I mentioned, we have a culture of sustainability APS. We're always doing energy efficiency measures. We never stop. So uh, Trisco Heritage is a relatively new school. It's about 10 or 12 years old now, I guess. But uh, we, we build energy efficiency into every new project and are continuously doing energy conservation measures district-wide where we can um, to make a bigger difference. So it was definitely not ignored. It was definitely uh, the first thing that we looked at and continue to look at in our district. Outstanding. Um, all right, moving right along. Um, we have a question asking uh, why building efficiency, especially insulation and air sealing is on the list of resiliency measures. Um, I know at least in uh, my slides, we had a very short non-comprehensive list of efficiency measures, but um, Tony or Ian, do you wanna speak to uh, the role? Yeah, so that's a great question. In fact, we are embedding uh, ASHRAE commissioning practices into our uh, efforts for resiliency. So I didn't touch on it because it gets a little techy, but we're, we're actually doing some, some deep dive into the commissioning of the mechanical systems, the chillers, the uh, chill water systems, uh, and the air side equipment as well in re regard to not only the, the distribution of sealing the air of the ductwork and the building envelope, but looking at how each of the different components are working or not working and then making those resolutions so that the building works more effectively. And to Indo's point, you can actually scale back some of the energy consumption and make your batteries or on-site uh, power gen last longer. And Brooke, as you'd mentioned in your initial definition of resilience, the, the one of the first things you do is work toward energy efficiency measures. I think that's a given. Um, I think our presentation here didn't focus on it because we were talking about some of the sure. other parts of it, but. Absolutely. No, well said. Um, okay, moving right along. Uh, in moving towards a 100% renewable energy program, what do you do to deal with the quote duck curve concerning energy production and time of use? What forms of large scale long-term energy storage can be found viable? Yeah, so. Uh, 
in Florida, we're not seeing that as much of an issue as say the, the renewable energy penetration of the grid, like in California. Uh, we actually, actually have pretty decent coincident loads because it's very air conditioning based. You know, the sun is shining, it's hot out, the chiller's running, you have a coincident load with the, the power generation. Uh, but we're also looking at hybrid energy storage. So having a smaller, more cost-effective battery paired with conventional, and I hate to say fossil fuel, but you know, uh, conventional power generation so that we can use that battery as a little bit more of a gap and then not have to have one that takes us all the way through nighttime operations, but uh, use the generator as needed to back charge the battery as we can keep the building operational. In New Mexico, we have lots of sun and we have a huge duck curve um, and we work in partnership with our utility to participate in peak shaving, especially during you know, summer months when the peaks get really high. Uh, so we use our schools uh, building automation systems to scale them back a little bit during high peak events. Um, they have access to uh, generator use from other entities throughout the, the city. Um, and so the community participates in smoothing out the duck curve by um, backing off resources or providing resources to the grid and backing off loads during uh, critical times. Awesome, thank you both. Um, I'm anxious to get to this next question on um, a request for overview of potential funding sources for community resilience projects and financing strategies. I can just say quickly that we have included in our resources as a follow-up uh, links to both uh, the Energy Resilience in the Public Sector page, which has um, a compilation of finding, funding and financing strategies for state energy offices and local governments um, that you can sift through. Uh, I know that our resilience page on the Better Building Solution Center has a variety of resources as well. Um, Tony and uh, Ian, are there any others? I know you've worked with HUD grants. Tony, you had a long list of folks that you you partnered with. Anything else you would like to add? I, either would, I just like want to comment that uh, having relationships, building relationships with different entities um, and being involved leads to uh, connections and opportunities. So the uh, main funding support we got was, was federal funding from the Energy Storage Research Project led by Dr. Emery Zhuk. Um, and they do some things called demonstration projects where they provide federal funding to projects that are pilots and demonstrate potential future opportunities. Um, and they happen to have a local conference, the local peer review conference in Albuquerque. And I got to meet Dr. Zhuk, some other players from Sandia Labs, and we sort of made the connections that way. Also, we, are, we involve our state energy office with our uh, monthly meetings. And so they were on board with helping participate financially um, just because they know the hard work we do to try and make everything efficient. So those are two sources we used. I would just add that, think outside the box a little bit if you're pursuing funding. Um, we targeted HUD funding that was geared towards mitigation and a lot of other cities in Florida want it, but they're using it to restore seawalls or uh, upgrade stormwater piping. Nobody else was using it for uh, mitigation of existing facilities and tying that to climate vulnerability. Uh, we actually had to do a little bit of uh, selling it to the folks in Tallahassee who are the facilitators of the grant, uh, but they got behind it and they actually helped us increase our ask. So we're able to, to really make investments across all six facilities that we wanted to. Awesome. I think we might have time for one more question. Um, I want to make sure Indu has a chance to weigh in. Um, Indu, I really enjoyed your presentation on REOPT. Is there a way that folks can get in touch um, with NREL if they want to use REOPT for their own facilities? Yes. Uh, so the final slide contains the information on where to provide feedback or ask questions about REOPT, and that is REOPT or send email to reopt at enrol.gov. So one of the reopt team members can respond to any questions that you have and feel free to access the web tool. It's really easy to use and we can perform a straightforward analysis with the sample site to get a insight into how it works. Outstanding. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I wanted to put in a plug uh, on funding for uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law um, there. 
is about to be a lot of resources available in terms of competitive grants available to local governments and states uh, and school districts. And a lot of those programs right now are uh, in development, but be sure to go to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law webpage uh, on DOE's homepage to keep in touch with the latest. Uh, and as always, you can stay in touch with the state and local um, newsletter in order to keep in touch with the latest updates. And with that, um, I think we'll have to end q and I have a couple uh, more updates to uh, share with you all before we end. I wanna make sure you all know about our summer webinar series. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of great lineup of presentations through August. You can visit the Better Building Solutions Center to learn, learn more and register. And we hope you'll join us on July 26th for our next webinar titled Driving Decarbonization with 50,001 Ready. You can join this webinar to learn how to use continuous improvement practices to decarbonize and reduce energy intensity. I also wanted to share about our progress report that DOE releases annually with key findings, updates, and metrics from the Better Buildings Initiative. You can visit the Better Building Solutions Center to explore the 2022 progress report to learn how DOE and partners like we have online here are working towards a more efficient, energy efficient future. And if you're interested in learning more about the topics discussed today, I encourage you to download our additional resources hand, handout from the Zoom chat box. The handout contains links to resources from Better Buildings and our speakers. And with that, I'd like to thank our panelists so much for taking the time to be with us today. Feel free to contact our presenters directly with additional questions, or if we couldn't get to your question during the Q&A period, um, I encourage you to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on LinkedIn and Twitter. You can all find our handles by our respective icons on the left-hand side. And you'll receive an email notice when today's recording slides and transcripts are available on the Better Building Solutions Center. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.